Hello friends, I am Dr. Rajesh Chokhania, General Pediatrician from Bandra, Mumbai and today we will be talking about interpretation of tone abnormalities. So for those of you who have been following our video series regularly, by now you know that we are all learning to anticipate findings after a good history. So besides getting a history of the baby being too loose or too tight, we may get a history of difficulty in changing diapers due to difficulty in separating the legs due to hypertonia or when there is a recent onset complaint of difficulty in walking or limping, one of the possibilities is a increase in the tone. In other words, like in all other situations, we can also anticipate tone abnormalities based on a good history. Further, we have always emphasized that observation at first contact gives a lot of information. So, a hypotonic infant looks loose or floppy and when this infant is lying in bed, it seems to be lying in a frog-like position, which means that the hip and knee is partially flexed, the hip is abducted and both the lower limbs are lying flat on the bed. If the infant is hypertonic or the child is hypertonic, we may get we may get to observe signs like persistent fisting or opisthotonus or scissoring of the legs or persistent plant reflection of the wrist or ankle or toe walking obviously these observation findings can be confirmed by a clinical examination so there are various maneuvers which help us elicit hypotonia in an infant when you hold an infant vertically suspended in midair from under his or her axilla, if the baby seems to be slipping through our hands, it suggests extreme hypotonia. Similarly, if we were to try and attempt to take the baby's hand towards the opposite shoulder, we realize that we can take the elbow well past the midline, suggesting hypotonia. Similarly, in these young babies or infants, if we were to flex the straightened lower limb on the trunk, we might be able to touch the feet of the baby to the forehead. Again, something which can only be done in the first few weeks of life normally. So all these clinical examinations suggest hypotonia. Hypotonia may be non-neurological. That is, the cause may be a systemic disorder like malnutrition because of poor muscle mass or a dyselectrolytemia like hypokalemia. When hypotonia is neurological, it could be central or peripheral. We can identify central hypotonia based on the fact that by and large there is no weakness. The power seems to be normal and if it is affected, it is affected very mildly and the dependent reflexes are preserved. As against this, in peripheral hypotonia, there is definite weakness and since most of the times this is due to a lower motor neuron disorder, we can further localize the anatomy of the problem by looking at the reflexes. So absent reflexes would suggest an anterior horn cell disease or a peripheral nerve disease whereas if the reflexes are preserved till late though may be somewhat depressed, it may suggest a muscle disease. Here we must remember that in a recent acute upper motor neuron lesion, sometimes we get hypotonia and absent reflexes and it is only after some time that the hypertonia and brisk reflexes come up. As we all know, this is the stage of spinal shock. Central hypotonia can be due to chromosomal disorders or it can be due to insult or injury to the brain in the newborn period. Even cerebellar disorders do have some degree of hypotonia and they can be suspected based on the associated corroborative findings. In fact, in some children with spastic hypertonic CP, we do get some areas of hypotonia on clinical examination. This may be due to damage to fibers which arise from the cortex down to the lower centers in the brain. In, in the same light, if we remember, we used to have children whom we used to call as hypotonic CP because clinically these children were very floppy but they were actually cerebral palsy and they had extensive brain damage. So the point is 
that brain damage when it is beyond a certain point or in certain areas it can lead to hypotonia and that is why we may see different tone abnormalities in the same patient at the same time now hyper extensibility of joints may appear like hypotonia so we need to differentiate that secondly in young infants sometimes we see hypotonia with a mild delay in motor milestones these infants are normal in all other domains and as time passes they also start catching up on their milestones and eventually turn out to be normal this is a probable form of benign hypotonia of infancy of course the diagnosis can be made only with time when no other new manifestation evolves and the older manifestations settle down coming to hypertonia when we find increased resistance and hypertonia we must also look for it by moving the limbs fast this will bring out two types of hypertonia it is called clasp knife spasticity if the resistance is only at the beginning of the flexion extension movement and then it suddenly gives way on fast movement this represents pyramidal tract lesions the other type is when there is resistance all along the movement even if the movement is rapid this is called lead pipe rigidity and it suggests extra pyramidal lesions in this sometimes there is momentary give away only to again find resistance and again find give away so the pattern is resistance give away resistance give away and this is known as cog wheel rigidity while we are examining for hypertonia if the limb goes into persistent tightening with some degree of twisting it is called dystonia which represents a basal ganglia problem also we must differentiate contractures from hypertonia so in a contracture the range of movement at that joint will be either reduced or absent depending on whether the contracture is dynamic or fixed we must also remember that contractures can occur in patients with differential muscle weakness or differential muscle strength even if they don't have hypertonia as we see in duchenne's muscular dystrophy when hypertonia is seen in only one half of the body it obviously suggests a central upper motor neuron lesion when hypertonia is seen in all four limbs it usually suggests a bilateral central lesion though the same thing is possible in a high cervical spinal cord lesion also however this is less common when hypertonia is seen only in the lower limbs it usually suggests a spinal cord lesion and if this hypertonia is asymmetrical it suggests a asymmetrical spinal cord lesion like a cord compression however this may also be seen in a spastic diplegic ct where the lesion is central it is in premature babies that the periventricular fibers get damaged and it leads to this situation at times we may see a little older child with slowly progressive spastic hyperton uh, para uh, spastic ct in the lower limbs only which is due to a genetic disorder like a metachromatic leukodystrophy or rarely a very slowly progressive congenital hydrocephalus which has been silent so far and is now manifesting because of the uh, uh, stretching of the periventricular fibers the first indication of hypertonia in the upper limbs usually comes in the pronation and supination of the wrist joints and in the lower limbs it is first seen in abduction adduction movements of the hip hypertonia is usually associated with brisk reflexes but in extreme long standing hypertonia it may be difficult to elicit reflexes because of contractures which we discussed so friends we realize that though superficially both hypertonia and hypertonia seem to Uh, represent a lower motor neuron lesion and upper motor neuron lesion but there are intricacies involved and at times hypotonia may in fact be central or even non neurological thank you
the next video will be by dr khare sir on interpretation of hemiparesis thank you